Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And we are at the halfway point of our Masters of the Air week. And in terms of the series, there's just one more part to go now on Apple TV. Joining me today is writer, create, creator, and producer John Orloff. And to say I'm excited to speak to him is a huge understatement. I'll bring him in now. Good afternoon, John. How are you today? I'm great, Paul. How are you? I'm really good. So I've got a list of questions here, but of course, the conversation... before we start, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think of myself as the creator of the show. Wow. Well, okay, but the know, creator of the show. Officially, I am not, but I, I uh, but I am the guy who wrote almost all of it. How about Brilliant. that? So I'm going to start with kind of an, an offbeat question, just to get your view. Sure. And, and it's going to be, what is Masters of the, Masters of the Air not? I.e., what expectations should viewers not have going into it? Well, it's obviously not Band of Brothers. Um, and <laughs> it, was not, it was not meant to be Band of Brothers in the air um, or the Pacific in the air. Um, we already made those shows and... Well, I, I wasn't part of the Pacific, but uh, and we wanted to explore different stuff, different ways, different narrative structures. Um, and it's not even thematically what Band of Brothers is about, mm. you know, which which is, you know, band is most definitely about brotherhood under fire, you know, and 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 your foxhole buddy. And this is a different a different tale entirely. Well, that's a great start. And, you know, I think we have this idea now that everything that comes along, we have to compare it to something else. Born is the new bond. Um, you know, how I met your mother is the new friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And right, right. it's our frame of reference. And, you know, the, one of the things that tackling the concept of the strategic bombing campaign is, is huge. And I, and I, perhaps you'll say we weren't actually tackling the strategic bombing campaign. Oh, oh no, we definitely were. We, to me, I mean, it, like band, it's about a lot of things. But, but one of the things that I think our show Masters is is definitely about um, is is about giving the audience the most visceral first person experience of what it was like to be in a bomber mm. in World War II during the daylight, you know, uh, American offensive against Germany air offensive and that and that was the goal to give you a visceral experience of of what these young men went through that that was job number one and i think that's something we can all agree um donald miller said it on monday the amount of emails he's received from people saying i kind of get what granddad went through now because exactly this is where you've gone from the written word to the screen is that no matter how brilliant a writer is, there's only so much you can convey with black text on white paper. And in the years since you did Band of Brothers, technology has increased to the point where things are possible that weren't even possible five years ago, let alone 20 years Precisely. ago. So, but to give the viewers an idea of just how long this has been part of your life, um, just run through basically how long this has been in in your in your um in your work domain it has been sort of every day of my life for 10 years um which is a, a really long time uh yeah it's been a very long complicated road getting us here uh so yeah 10 years is a long time it's been a long time and and a lot of it was research a lot of it was writing um and then making and editing, everything on this show has been um, complex and more difficult than we thought it would be when we started everything, mm. just because of the scale of it. Again, I think from, from, from day one, at least when I got involved, um, the, the goal has always been to convey to the audience counterpointed to that sort of really personal visceral experience was the scale of the air war and the scale of everything involved in getting a B-17 in, in, in the air and everything involved emotionally for those guys. Um, everything involved from the, the manufacture of B-17s. Obviously we're not showing that, but I, I think when you see, you know, the first battle sequence in, in Masters of the Air, I, I, I think you see 12, 17, 18, 20 planes. I can't remember the first Bremen mission. Um, but by the, the mission you're going to see in episode nine, 
it's a very it's a it's a mission over berlin in 1945 and all, all you need to know is thousands of airplanes are in the air and they're all american you know and so so the scale was always a part of it and yet mm -hmm. that very scale is one of the things that made it so incredibly hard to make well, that dovetails nicely to a question I have down in that, you know, you famously wrote episode two of Band of Brothers, and we're not going to discuss Band, but depicting, for example, the attack on the guns at Breckor Manor, you don't need to explain much about that. There's the guns. They're firing at, at, at Utah Beach. Go in and knock them out. How difficult was it to convey to an audience in 2024 what the combined bomber offensive is all about, you know, and the, and the fact that it isn't a constant thing because they are the ideas they had in 42 of what it could achieve changes in 43 and 44 and 45. And we can talk about exactly. all the research you've well, done. And, and that's one of the reasons why we actually go out. Well, I shouldn't say go out of our way, but we often don't explain any of that. Yeah. You know, we're just, we make the changes in production you know, granted, we didn't get every single thing right, and we can talk about that in a second. But but we do change their uniforms. We do change their oxygen masks. We do change a lot of things over the course of, of the nine episodes. Um, and I'm sorry, I totally forgot the question. <laughs> uh, I'm just so hanging off every word I forgot what it was. I mean, just basically the... Um... The, the trying to convey the complexity of a doctrine that is changing. But oh, then, right, as right. Said, so so as you said, that the doctrine is changing through the war and, and you know, we bring it up as it's as it relates to our very specific characters. You know, when Rosie suddenly is re-upping, not suddenly, when he re-ups for his second tour of duty, you know, that is exactly when the 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 strategy changes. So we bring that up then, but we get it through Rosie's eyes. We, the audience are informed via Rosie yeah. and his experiences. Same with just how the mission counts go up. We see that through Rosie's eyes, not through, you know, the general staff officers. So um, everything is meant to be, you know, we can't do it from the platoon level, which is sort of more how band was working. Yeah. We are working on a group level. Because, uh, as you know, these these guys were in different squadrons, um, which was a challenge as a writer, right? And and I think that's another thing that um, when you said what not to compare this show to, you know, band uh, is about platoon scale. I mean, I guess it's about a company, but usually in the episodes you'll see we focusing on one of the platoons. Um, and um, this is not that case. We don't focus yeah. on one squadron or which would have been at full strength, 12 airplanes and 120 guys. We don't focus on that, nor do we focus on one plane, which would have been 10 guys. And we focus on four guys who are in the same group, you know, so they do know each other, unlike in the Pacific where, where those guys were, not necessarily always on screen together. These guys are always in the same group, uh, but but they're in different different jobs. You know, they're in different places. In, in Buck and Bucky's case, different squadrons. Um, so it was always about focusing on the guys, their relationship, and how they're experiencing the war and getting orders from their perspective. Again, a good example is the Munster mission of October 10th which is actually a, a really seminal moment in the American daylight bombing situation. And, and that's why we show that up, that um, mission over the Bremen. There's a couple of reasons why, you know, you have to make choices. And obviously the, the Bremen mission where um, Clevin goes down is not in the show, which is October 8th, 1943. It's October 10th, 1943, we show. And, and one of the reasons in that decision is that's that's the mission where everything changes where we go from mm. totally taking great pride as americans in not targeting any sort of civilian structures um up until that point it was really only been u-boat pens on on the coast not really near any civilians and factories uh, also outside of city centers and then on october 10th we changed that and so we get a little bit into it in, in the show, but but that's the only way we could do it on the scale of, of the story we were telling. 
Well, thank you for that. And I, I, each thing you say makes me think of a thousand questions. But I want to bring it back to character because we did a show a few weeks sure. ago with Roland White, who did a fantastic book about the mosquito bother. Mm -hmm. And he was saying in Learning to Write, he, someone said to him, what comes first, story or character? And he said, well, isn't it story? And the person said, no, no, it's always character. And, yeah. I, I'm, and you're nodding in agreement, which, yeah, which yeah. is good. It is character, and it's character in this. It, it starts from um, my understanding is Steven Spielberg read the book before Tom did. And when he read the book, um, he fell in love with Buck and Bucky, you mm -hmm. know, um, and their natural story is, is so phenomenal. Uh, meeting before the war, uh, becoming best friends before the Americans entered the war, I should say, 1940. Um, uh, being in the in the in the U.S. Army when it's very very small prior to Pearl Harbor for almost two years as best friends and pilots, war starts. Obviously, you've seen what happens to them in, in their service in the hundredth. End up in the same POW camp. They have some pretty amazing adventures in episode nine, actually, uh, outside the camp, um, and it's an amazing story and. He, he instinctively said, I think this could be what, what the third one is about. Uh, sent it to Tom. Tom agreed. Sent it to me. I agreed. Uh, I think they had already thought about Rosie. And then um, I think one of my big sort of big ideas was uh, uh, bringing in Harry Crosby uh, as a major fourth character. Um, so it evolved, uh, you know, kind of going from Buck and Bucky to then, well, let's make Rosie a really big character. And then, oh, well, Crosby's really the narrative glue of the whole show. Because when you think about it, Buck and Bucky actually only overlap with Rosenthal, uh, well, for only th three missions in three yeah. days. They only go on three missions overlapping each other. Uh, Rosie arrived, I think, in September of 43 as a, as a, um, you know, as a replacement. And, uh, you know, three weeks later, Buck and Bucky are down. And Rosie then becomes the sort everybody in the hundredth would agree that Rosie becomes sort of the symbolic leader of the hundredth for the rest of the war, kind of replacing Buck and Bucky, who had 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 that role uh, from June to October of 43. Um, but you needed somebody to overlap to connect those two time periods. You know, yeah. the, the time period with Buck and Bucky to the time period after Buck and Bucky. And uh, also the generational tone changes, in my opinion, in, in who these pilots are, right? This, that first generation of pilots are very different than the subsequent generation of pilots and crew members and their attitudes um, to about everything. But, 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 and Crosby changes. I don't know, like that moment where in episode six, you know, he takes out, there's a lot of little shit in Masters of the Air. When he is in episode six and he's in uh, Oxford and he's by himself, almost naked, he's taking out the rim in his hat. Now that's a big yeah. deal. Yeah. So up until that point, if you watch the show, he doesn't have a crushed cap. He was a by the book guy. Right. And um, obviously Buck and Bucky weren't and, and they had the crush cap. That's the moment when Crosby sort of becomes an adult and he gets he makes his own crushed cap by taking out that wire. And you'll see he wears a crushed cap for the rest of the show. And that's one of the moments where the show is sort of transferring from before Munster when the when the men are very romantic, sort of excited about getting into the war. They're. They've got their their uh, you know their they're not handkerchiefs they're uh, you know scarves yep. their silk scarves and cocked hats and Rosie's not that guy you know um, he, and, and that second generation was much less that you know mm. um, it was not about the romance of flying or the Hollywoodism of flying um, it was about getting the job done in a much more uh, I don't know, workmanlike way. Hmm. So, but, so Crosby is that narrative yeah. glue. The malarkey connects all in of our characters. Ways. And interestingly enough, interestingly enough, he is, he is, I, I don't want to, at one point I thought he was the only, I, I could be wrong about this. 
He's the only guy from the original 360 flight crewmen that arrived in June of 1943 who is still there by VE day of 1945. Everybody else is gone. So he's literally the only guy that arrived with the first group of people. And I thought that was really interesting too. Yeah. Um, Kid does not, I think we, we don't show Kid leaving. There's just only so much time you can do. Kid ends up going back. Um, yeah. Um, let's talk about Munster again, Mayor, because you talked yeah. about it as being a pivotal moment in the in the narrative of the show. But a question from Stuart Burbridge or a comment from Stuart is saying, surely overall the Munster mission wasn't exceptional just for the hundredth. And one thing, and I'm gonna tie that into someone saying that the show didn't depict big week. And this is where Masters of the Air is on the one hand, trying to tell the story of the entire 8th Air Force, but it's also trying to tell the story of the 100th Bond Group, but it's also, as you said there, trying to follow a few characters. So how do you balance what's important narratively, what's important historically? Well, that's, that's, that's what I spent 10 years doing. Yeah. <laughs> that's the trick, right? Um, and it's, it's, there's no easy, easy answer. Um, can you pull up that question about Munster again? What was the actual... Question: Surely, overall, Munster mission wasn't exceptional. No, it was exceptional for the whole Eighth Air Force because right. it was the first time a civilian, uh, the middle of a city, was targeted, and everybody knew that there would be civilians. It, and throughout the whole Eighth Air Force that morning, there were very there were different responses all through through East Anglia. There were mm. a lot of it. It felt anti-American to to knowingly kill civilians. It was a, there were a lot of complaints up, upstairs. There were a general or two who disagreed with it. I mean, it was a very big decision. And once they made that decision, they never went back, obviously. And if anything, they went more aggressive by, by Dresden and Hamburg, you know, later on. So it, it, was, it was a big deal for everybody. Now, again, I'm only showing that through the perspective of the hundredth because yeah. that's who we're watching. So when that happened, there is a real story about John Egan when he heard uh, that they were going to, they mentioned it in the briefing that it was going to hit civilians probably. And, and John Egan was on his feet applauding. He was so excited about it. Most of those guys were because two days earlier, they'd lost all their best friends. They lost, I think it's 10 planes. I can't remember on Bremen, the second Bremen mission of October 8th. They lost a hundred guys. So, so, so this was a revenge mission for a lot of these guys, you know, let's remember. So the hundredth arrives in June of 43 with 36 B-17s and 360 men that would fly in them, air, air crewmen. By October, so on October 8th, 10 go down meaning that by that point, 24 of the 36 are gone. So, so, and in one day, almost a third of all your friends are gone, right? And so they were really emotional about a mission only, not even a, a 48 hours later, you know? Uh, so the Munster mission was, was very emotional. And there, equally, there were people who refused to fly, like we sort of showed Crookshank, and yeah. Murphy, who were both Catholic. And they're the ones who are sort of saying, give, giving Egan a little pushback, saying it's Sunday, this is a church. Um, so, so, you know, we bring this stuff up from the point of view of the characters we're telling the story about. And, and their life on the ground is, is, is going to be different than the decision makers in London. And I'm glad you mentioned on the ground there, because on my list of questions is the balance between what's going on in the air and what's going on the ground. Because what I didn't want to see was nine episodes of just B-17s flying into Germany every every episode, because it would be repetitive. I mean, you could say, yeah. well, they're, 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 they've got fighter escorts now. There's more of them there, but it will be repetitive. And Mary Brazier did a show with us last uh, last uh, two weeks ago about bomber command and the psychology and psychiatry that was going on she, she specifically said i really appreciated the appearance of a flat house unsurprisingly given her background was there a deliberate decision to reflect uh 
the emotional impact on the crews? Almost immediately. That that was the sort of yin and yang of the original ideas were, okay, well, how is this different than Band of Brothers? And therefore, why is it interesting for us to make it, right? Because we don't want to just make Band of Brothers in the yeah. sky. Well, well, one of the big, huge differences is, is, is the seesaw of air combat. And the seesaw meaning, you know, you wake up in bucolic East Anglia, you have a nice breakfast of hot coffee, the, the best breakfast anybody was eating in Europe, yeah. basically, for, for, for real, right? Um, eggs, bacon, coffee, uh, they get in their plane, they go on six hours, seven hours of pure fucking hell. Just like Bastogne, right? Just as intense of, of what you see in band in Bastogne with actually way higher casualties than you see in Bastogne. They come home in these horrific situations and then they can get a drink at the bar and, and maybe go to town and get laid. And which you can't do in, in Band of Brothers. You can't do in an Okinawa, you, you know? Yeah. And so you have this seesaw between civilization and, and, and the most barbarous warfare possible on a daily basis. And, and that is really interesting dramatically. And, and how do they get back into that plane after these horrific well, that, it's funny you said that, things that, that happen is, is really important. And, and yes, so the Flack House, there was always a Flack House episode from yep. the second you know, I, I started working on the show and started to break it down. I mean, my, my first year of the 10 years was writing a, um, yeah, hold on. Ah. Don't go away, anybody. Ah. We're not going away. We're hanging off every word. Um, is, is this 250-page yep. book, you know, with pictures? Wait, there we go. Yeah, you know, uh, oh, there's England. You know, there's the pub, the, the Vikings Head pub. Um, you know, which laying out the whole show. What we got here. That looks like replacements. Yeah, there's Lemons is working on some of the new planes with the help of Billy and Sam, the two kids. Those two kids are real. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, so yeah. So my first thing was. What are they, I, I've gone off. Uh, I've lost my train of thought again. Well, we're um, talking about Flack House, the Flack House, and right. So that's around. the Flack House is in there, and and the Flack House is in in Don's book too. You know, um, so so a lot of like the things. So, so like Don would write about the Flack House, but not specific to our guys. Like that chapter, yeah. he doesn't mention the hundredth at all. So I had to figure out from our guys. Well, what did, did Rosie ever go to the Flack House? So maybe we do the Flack House via Rosie, and it turns out he did. And he went to the Flack House in a really interesting moment in his in his military career, which is, you know, Rosie flies on the Bremen mission of October eighth, where almost half the planes get shot down. Ten. That's on a Saturday. Sunday, there's a milk run but it's a mission. He flies on that mission day. Nobody gets shot down. And then Monday is, you know, 12 out of 13 planes get shot down. So he, he, in three days, 23 airplanes and 230 men have gone down and he's the only survivor. So, you know, normally you don't go on at a flack house after three missions, but, um, but they made Rosie go. And so that just fit in perfectly from a dramatic standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. This new character we've just met, you know, we have these three missions and then we can follow him in the flack house and, and sort of, you know, experiment with that and, and, and learn what's going on there. And then the other thing Rosie said in one of his interviews, um, the only time he was ever afraid to get into a cockpit was that first mission after Munster, after the Flack House, because he said he was out of his rhythm. He, he, he had mm -hmm. gotten into a rhythm and for whatever, you know, one day, Saturday, fly, survive. Sunday, fly, survive. Monday, fly, survive. Now you take me out of it for two weeks. And he, that first, it, it was almost exactly how I have it written. He, 
kept on looking at the other hard stand and saw this younger pilot and he you know he walked around his own ship for a long time just double checking you know oh, checking the thing and checking that before he got the 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 stuff to get back in that cockpit and then he said he never he never second guessed getting into the cockpit again for the next however many missions it's interesting you said that because that was the point don miller raised on monday is that i asked him about the um the gradual understanding we have in 2024 of strategic bombing and combined our bomber friends we can look at the people have done the data now they know what the weak points were on b-17s and b-24s people have come to the understanding of what worked and what didn't work with strategic bombing although there is some debate but the question that in a sense cannot be answered is what made those men walk on that tarmac and get in yeah. a bomber whether they're RAF, US Army, Air Force, or any nation, when they've just Absolutely. seen half of their friends be killed. And in, in, you know, it's an impossible question to answer. All you can do is ask it and then hope the audience somehow yeah. make their own decision. Yeah, we don't answer a lot of questions in this show, actually. You know, we don't answer the questions about the moral, the moral issues surrounding this bombing, you know, on, on either side. We don't, we just sort of say, this is what these guys went through. You know, that's enough. That's enough. You know, um, we don't get into that stuff in band or the Pacific either. I don't know why people would expect us to on this show. It's interesting you said that because I, I see that you're allowing the viewer to consider these things. You're showing. Yeah. German we bring them up as subjects. You know, you yeah. see London, you see a little bit of London bombing. I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, there was a, we, 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 we had we had very few budget constraints, but of course, at the end of the day, you do have budget constraints. And one of the one of the scenes that I'm sad we don't have is there's an alternate version of of Egan when that same moment in the show, or maybe it's a different moment, but in the same episode, episode four, the, the episode to sort of show you how awful bombing is, or one of the episodes to show you that we had Egan. Um, going down into the subway in London and seeing how how the people were living in the subways right. like rats, um, and we made a, a a point about that. And then he went up and he was in a whole uh, neighborhood that had been bombed out when he gets out of the subway. Um, but alas, budgetary constraints uh, made it a couple of buildings up up on the uh, on the surface. And then well, we guess, see the bombings in in Russell Scheim or yeah. uh, and then we'll see it in episode nine in Nuremberg. Um, wow. And I'm guessing we could fill an entire show about all the things you'd have loved to have seen in the show. I, yeah, part, I mean, part, yeah, you, you know. have no idea how many drafts and versions and oh, I wrote the Bremen going down action scene. Clevin going down that we never shot. I wrote, we just tried a lot of stuff. You know, this was a really, really hard show and it was hard getting the balance of all the, the elements right, you know? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of stuff, not just on the editing floor, but, but on the sort of script writing floor. I mean, I was, someone said, you know, Trevor Sheehan said in the sidebar, how many script versions did it go through? But I guess you can't really count. It's 10 years. I can of... actually. Okay. I wrote, there are, I have 400 files labeled Masters of the Air scripts. Wow. Okay. Now they're not all full scripts, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes it'll just be a scene that I was sending that day for production. That was a, a, a rewrite. But, but I would, I would, estimate at least 20 drafts an episode wow wow i mean that that that, that tells us something i think the the overriding message i've been trying to send out since this began is how many people were working in this involved in this who wanted to get it right who had the sense of duty they wanted to show what these men went through and the women who followed them and supported them and Precisely. there's only so much you can do and and of course little mistakes get through and cutbacks have to be made and things have to be omitted and condensed but it, it it's obviously a rewarding process to see it finally come out well we had i mean yes it it's extremely rewarding um we, we had an amazing crew and it was quite large 
um, especially as we got to two units shooting. Um, so we had one unit shooting the first four episodes. And as uh, that director and his crew got to around episode three, the next directors, which were a team, started pre-production for their two episodes. So we went from around, I don't know, seven to 800 people working every day to about 1,200 people mm. working every day in the middle of COVID, right? Yeah. So if one person gets COVID, we have to stop shooting um, at great expense. Uh, so we really don't want to get COVID. So that meant we had lots of COVID people working on the show too, you know, making sure we don't touch things, cleaning things, testing. We all had to be tested every day. So just want to put that in the mix that, that on top of everything else, it was a very, it was logistically very hard. So we, we have, you know, on a day where we had a couple hundred extras, which you'll see in episode nine on those days, you know, we could have 1,500 people working on the show. Now we're all, wow. you know, I can't supervise all 1,500 people's work. You know, it just doesn't work that way. Um, no single person can. So, um, you know, yes, eventually it all gets to my eyes and other producers' eyes, Tom and Gary and Steven. And, but by that point, sometimes it's too late. We can't fix what isn't quite 100% right. Mm. You know, um, that said, the dedication of these people, so many people were fans of Band of Brothers in the Pacific that worked on this show. So many people knew how important it was, you know, to, to get things right. And, you know, in particular, the, the, our incredible production designer, Chris Seegers, he had a crew of about 300 people including multiple full-time researchers, multiple people, that all they did was just fucking try to know exactly what Stalag Luft 7 looked like and exactly where the buildings were and exactly where the ice pool was and exactly, did they use a Roman numeral three or did they use the Arabic numeral three? Do you know Paul Woodage right now? Uh, Arabic. They did use Arabic. Most people bad. think they use the big pay because in most publications, though, you see it in, in Roman numerals. Um, I didn't know that. I'm sure part of your people who were. Oh, there'll right be now, someone there who did know. Yeah, but I I'm mean, sure they did. You know, but 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 there's only so much things any one person can know about the Eighth Air Force. You know, I mean, that's the other thing. It's not like a, a it's not like a company of men like like Band of Brothers. Like, not that there's a finite amount of knowledge about that either. But, well, that's but, a good. But it's a lot more finite than, well, that's a good point than to trying to know on. everything about the Hundredth Bomber Group, which was filled with I don't know four thousand. So so just so you know, like. The, the, the Thorpe Abbots had 3,500 people working on the base, right? That was just, they were, of which 10%, maybe 15% were air crewmen, right? Yeah. The 10 guys to a plane. For 36 to 42, depending on where in the war we're talking, but roughly 36 to 46, 48 airplanes. Um, that's a lot of people. And then with all the turnovers, there were thousands you know, of airmen who went through the hundredth, you know, because they would tour out. They would either get shot down or killed uh, or, or in a POW camp and then more would come in and then they'd either do their 25 missions or their 30 missions or their 35 missions and then they'd rotate out, you know. So, so again, you know, Bucky and Buck would have rotated out if they hadn't been shot down or they would have been bumped upstairs and, and you know, would have been working in London. And there's no show in that. Let's talk about the fact that there isn't often a single truth. People can say that that yeah. truck wasn't there in 41, yeah. that only came out in 43. But in terms of the experiences of air crews flying over occupied Europe, in the debriefs, which you show in some of the earlier episodes, you would have multiple versions of exactly the same event. So exactly. how do you as a writer tackle that? You know, well, the here's a great example. 45 degree angle or? Here's a great illustration. So yes, you're right. And, and we, we took the um, after reports very seriously. 
We took the battle sequences very, very seriously. I think that comes from my work on Day of Days, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Day of Days is super accurate, and it's super accurate because I interviewed all the men who were still alive in 1999. You know, Winters, Compton, Lipton, Malarkey, uh, Garnier. I'm just whoever else I can't remember off the top of my head. And I put it together. Ambrose got tons of shit wrong in in the book, and I put it together in sort of a Rashomon way, not. Just in that case, not everybody's memories were the same. Yeah, and and yeah. and just figuring out the timeline of Breakor Manor and how you would see it visually was its own task because Lipton's memories of when he was in the tree and when that guy got shot in the field is slightly different. When I, I so I did the same thing with this, which is taking these after reports and and mapping out these battles as accurately as I could. So for example, in episode three, the Regensburg episode, the heart of the episode was Clevin and what Clevin experienced that day. And, and the big idea being he was shot six times. He was hit six times, pretty much direct hits every time. And he, he stays in the air. And so I took all the documents about Regensburg and the hundredth and the after reports and the memoirs and the diaries and Saturday evening post and all of those sources tried to figure out a timeline that, that made sense mapped against those six hits of Clevin. So that was the starting off point. Now by, by, that's that's and episode three was always like that. That was always going to be like day of days was to band the brothers. Regensburg was going to be to mashes of the air. It was going to be the episode where both the audience and the main characters realize what the fuck we just really got into. Right. And um, in a more real time way, you know, it's it's one mission. It's it's one mission on Regensburg. It's one battle on D-Day in a 24-hour period, right? They're both 24-hour periods. So anyway, so uh, in the so that was always episode three. And in the course of developing the show, Kurt Biddick became a more important character than he was originally. Um, and we sort of all agreed at a certain point that he was the character we were going to be surprised die. Um, there was a version where we actually got to know, uh, uh, in episode one, Schmallenbach, Adams, and Petrick, the three ships that went down. There was a version of episode one where you really got to know those guys. And then they're dead by the end of the episode. And we realized we're sort of wasting screen space with guys that we don't, maybe we should hold off on that idea. So we transferred that idea to Biddick, whom Crosby saves in episode two, right? And then, obviously, he died in the Regensburg mission in real life. So that was a thing for us. And then, and then Carrie had the really fine idea of casting Barry Keoghan in that role. So you had a name actor that you wouldn't expect die. So now we've set up the situation dramatically where we, the audience, have invested in, in Kurt Biddick, and he's going to die in the end of episode three. How does he die? Well, I'd always had him dying in episode three. And the first version of having him die, he died how one after report reported it. And that after report said there was a, a, a lot of people bailed out, you know, the, the plane got hit, bailout, and Biddick and Snyder crawled out of the, the, the cockpit, got an oxygen fire. Biddick and Snyder crawled out of the cockpit as it's flying out of the side windows, which could open, trying to put on their parachutes. And one of them, probably Snyder, couldn't get it on, falls out and is hit by the rear stabilizer. And one version, I think, said he was cut in half. And Biddick dies with the plane exploding in that version, I think. 
And that was certainly dramatic. And so I wrote that version. But then as Biddick had become a more important character dramatically, and he was friends with, with, with um, Kurt, uh, with, sorry, with, with Buck and Bucky, which is sort of a dramatic license. He, he wasn't. Um, but we built him up as like one of the inner circle with, with those two guys. So that his death would have a, a more dramatic, visceral feeling for us, the audience. So uh, it was Carrie's idea, I think, to change it to there is another version of Biddick going down. And in this other version, he and I think Snyder are both still in the plane and it goes down. And as it's going down, they see a small German village and Biddick at the last second realizes they're heading for the village and he makes a decision to just veer away and crash. So those are the two versions that were presented to the higher ups of what happened to Biddick. And it, it speaks to your question of you don't always know what really happened because yeah it's a fucking battle and people are shooting and you know, you're not taking too copious of notes about the other plane going down. Cause you just want to make sure your plane doesn't go down. That's what you're focused on. Right. So anyway, so, so I think Carrie rightly said, you know, why don't we make Biddick's death tie in a little bit more to his friend and co-pilot Snyder who, if you, when you rewatch the show, he's the guy in the first episode who freezes his hands and Biddick goes mm -hmm. to talk to him because, again, being very accurate, when a squadron leader like Clevin flies on a plane like he did with Biddick on the first mission, right? So it's Biddick and Clevin on, on our mission one. The co-pilot automatically goes into the tail and the tail gunner stays home, or is the 11th gun if they have an 11th gun. We don't explain any of that because it's not really important for you to know because we know it. And so, yep. so, you know, so Snyder is in the tail and he's the one that gets the thing and Biddick visits him after, after the mission and they have a little moment in, in, in the hospital and that's the guy he's trying to save going down. So, you know, it's it's a different version of the truth that pays off a little bit more satisfyingly as a character arc for Biddick. Brilliant. You know, well, he yeah, go ahead. I was going to say I'm going to take it back to what you said there about when people rewatch because one of the things that I talked about on Facebook is when I was a kid, you went to see a film, you saw it once, and then you probably didn't see it again for two or three years until it came out on TV. And this is before the days of VCRs. You always knew this is going to be on a streaming service with Apple. So does yeah. that affect the writing in that you're anticipating people will watch it more than once in those first couple yes. of weeks? Yes, I mean, that... I, I mean, the second I had the job, I knew that. I mean, people watch yeah. Band of Brothers twenty times. You know, yeah. In fact, I think I knew that more than Apple knew it. You know, um, uh, yeah, I, I knew that, and 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 I think the crew knew it as well, and. Uh, yeah, and, and when you watch this show again, you'll see little things feeding into later beats, and you will track guys. You know, yeah. it's funny. When, when Band of Brothers was first made, um, and I started to see the dailies of episode two, you know, I, I didn't go. So on Masters of the Air, I was there for the whole shoot in yeah. England, which was a, an amazing experience, which we should talk about at some point, because, this again, the scale was just crazy. At Band of Brothers, I visited the set for like a week or two on Day of Days, but but I wasn't there for, for the whole shoot. Um, but I remember getting the dailies and looking at the dailies and going, oh, we are so fucked because all I see is eight or a dozen really handsome dudes wearing green right. <laughs> and helmets and their, their faces are painted black, right? Because it's D-Day. Like... And yet some people think it's really a really good episode and they track it and it all works. You know, I'm not sure people felt that the first time they saw it. You know, um, I, I know there were the, the reviews were positive on 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 band, but not universally. And, and one of the complaints early on was I can't keep track of who's who. 
Well, that's, I mean, my analogy that I talked about on my on World War II TV is Band of Brothers has become the comfortable pair of shoes we put on when we get out from at work. Whereas at the moment, yeah. Master of the Air is our brand new pair of shoes, which we will yeah. grow to fit us. But right now, yeah. they're still a bit stiff. Um, yeah, completely. Um, and I think episode nine, when it all comes together, um, you know, the other thing that's different about Masters is it's one story. Yeah, as you have noticed, there are no episode titles. Um, and that's because they're not really standalone episodes like mm. they were in Band. You know, I think Band has very delineated episodes. And in, in fact, I know it was a conscious decision to have every single episode sort of its own mini movie in a way, you know. Different episodes focus on different characters, um, and they have a definitive ending to them. You and know, episode one has the definitive ending of the the, the not coup the um, you know again Sobel you know, and uh, that is a definitive ending. And, yeah. and obviously, episode two has has Winters is now a leader, you know, and and that is. A definitive end and episode three is an exploration into cowardice or non cowardice and a whole new character and you never see that character again you know and episode six is a, is about you know Roe and the and the um nurse and you never really see them again either you know i mean obviously not the nurse but even Roe is he just sort of goes back into the shadows. I mean, the actor is wonderful and he's in the rest of the show, but he doesn't have that starring moment. This was different. This was, this is a story about these four men from the beginning to the end, right? It's, it's not about other guys. Um, yeah, we deviate a little bit here and there and, and sort of kind of shine a little highlight on, on Bailey and, and, um, Quinn and and the comet line and shine a little light on the Tuskegee guys and but it's really about these four guys you know well let's and it's with one story it, it, it is and you've made me think about and when you see episode it. nine I think what I'm really I'm really excited for people to see episode nine see it all wrapped up and sort of take a, 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 a sit back and really yeah. realize this is this is an odyssey. You know, it's an odyssey, particularly for Buck and Bucky, you know, of, of sort of leaving home and going on these adventures that are death defying. And, you know, then they come home. Spoiler alert. Um, so well, and that's very different than what Band of Brothers is. Yeah. You know? I love the way you use Odyssey. That's going to go straight into my my descriptive terms for that. But I want to deal with a few of the questions we've had from the viewers because sure. there's some great ones there. I um, mean, this has come out from several viewers, and it's how has the show been received in Germany? I absolutely have no idea. Nobody's told me. Okay, I mean, well, that's one for for the later. But I mean, it, yeah. it's an interesting thing that it is an international show. People are seeing it around the world, but we haven't got an answer to that. Um, you said about being on the set, yeah. So tying in with that, Rob Crane is saying. John said it turned out to be much more complex to film. What specifically caused challenges compared to what they anticipated? Is that something you can kind of share about being there sure. for that time? Well, I mean, COVID. COVID yeah, really COVID. complicated things. Um, the, the scale of it, it, it was always, the scale of it was just astronomical in terms of getting something done in a day, you know, and getting all these things to coalesce on one moment of filmmaking you know it, it was how are you going to what do you i mean just, you just start with b-17s all right we're gonna make a show about b-17s that sounds easy well does it are we going to use real b-17s where are we going to find those real B b-17s can we ensure those real b-17s do the owners of those b-17s really want us running around and bumping into things no okay we can't do that so now what do we do is that, I mean, it just, these conversations would go on and on and on. And, and up until, I don't know, uh, two, well, maybe three months before shooting, we were going to have green screen, not the volume. And then the technology had really shifted to a point where we could use the volume. Well, that meant we had to recalibrate 
everything how we were doing the special effects. Instead of doing green screen, now we're going to do the volume. Well, that meant we had to build volume sets, and we have to build them really, really fast because we didn't plan on this. And it was, it was, it was that kind of of stuff, you know. Um, and then, like, you know, I mean, again, it's the logistics were amazing. I, the things we had to build, you know. Uh, so I'm really still to this day amazed by the set for Thorpe Abbotts for. Airbase 139, uh, which uh, was composed of at least a dozen buildings. And they were all, with the exception of headquarters, they were all Nissan huts, right? And the combo Nissan huts. And uh, then headquarters was brick built accurately. And we had the plans. I mean, the amount of detail was crazy. You, you, we had, and, and, and they would have things. So that this whole village was set up with, with all practical lighting. And what, what that meant was there were not false ceilings, yeah. right? So you'd walk into a, a Quonset hut that's say the hospital and it was a full hundred percent, you know, dome, there we go, dome and side avenues. And it was fully, there was a dozen beds. And it was like that for 10 months. You'd walk down the road and that was the interrogation room. It had all those tables and all those. And it was like that. You could walk in it on a Monday and it looked like that. Or you could wait four months later and it was still like that. Now, that's not normal in filmmaking. In filmmaking, you'd build three of those Quonset hunts and redress them as yeah. needed. You'd make it on Monday, it's the hospital. On Tuesday, it's the interrogation room. On Wednesday, it's the briefing room. You know, no, no, no. We built them and they were dedicated. The headquarters was an insane set. It has a, you think you are in a time warp. The, you'll know this, Paul. What are the code, the code machines, the giant code machines? Um, the, I don't know what, what they were called, right? Mm -hmm. They're not obviously enigmas. Whatever ours were, and they were big black with these fucking giant lights and stuff. Our props guy found the only ones that still existed in continental Europe and had them brought over and we put, and it's never in the show. You know, pieces of paper in typewriters would have the off, they would be real paperwork from the hundredth from 80 years ago. They found the paperwork, you know, I mean, it was just, it was extraordinary. The, the bomb so, is what that was. Hmm? The machine is the bomb. The British the, with, a, with an E. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And it, it was just amazing. And, and it was, it was just, it was a very hard shoot. You know, it was, COVID was a real, was really hard. You know, COVID really made it more difficult because oh. every shoot day meant, you know, you can only shoot for so many hours a day, right? 10 yeah. hours a day, say, with a one hour lunch break. Otherwise you go into overtime. Okay. Well, the first two hours of that 10 hours, is waiting for your COVID test and the return of your COVID test, right? So that's part of the day. It's just people sitting around getting paid, which is just how it works. But it meant we're only getting seven hours of work, not nine, you know? So that's hard. And if somebody gets COVID, then what do you do? Well, you have to shut down. We shut down some of the time. You know, in episode six, when, when Egan is, is the Russellshine thing, and Egan is on the wagon, right? The, and the Germans are pulling him. The grips got sick that day. They got COVID on set. So suddenly there's nobody to move lights and the whole grip crew had to be, you know, left, had to be quarantined. So now what do we do? Well, we, you know, God bless, you know, uh, Ryan and Anna, they kept shooting and I don't know who <laughs> ended up carrying all that stuff, you know? So it was tough. It was tough. Well, uh, the insight you're giving is fantastic. A um, couple of tough, quite tough questions coming your way now. So this is like a representative Go ahead. one. Bring them on, baby. Bring them on. Why do they have to change the circumstances and how some people actually died, especially changing when and what mission Bubbles died on, yeah. for example? So this is obviously narrative. Yeah, no, no, Bubbles is a tough one. No, no, I, I, I have no. This was a. This trust me, this was not done um, haphazardly. Um, Bubbles' death, you're totally right, is is inaccurate. Um, in fact, 
whole bunch of his sort of when, who is group navigator is, is also cheated uh, when Bubbles is and when Crosby is. And, and that's because we just don't have time. Bubbles dies in a month that we don't actually even show on camera. Right. Right. So we go from October 10th of 1943 to, I can't remember, January or March of of 44 no no march of 44 right that for the, the the jump from episode six to episode seven is a huge jump and it's done dramatically for a lot of reasons and we can certainly talk about it but but from the historical standpoint bubbles dies in between those so no matter what right doesn't he die when does bubbles die i'm pretty sure bubbles really dies april 44 over, over france, over france. Sorry, yeah. i'm not yeah. Uh, I thought it was November. You might be right. You might be right. Um, but but there is a point where where drama has to work, and so we needed Crosby to have certain feelings by a certain time. And if you're right, and it is April, that's still not in our episode, right? Because episode seven is only March and and eight, and episode eight, we're now in June. So no matter what, it was gonna be hard. And that's not a mission that we show. I mean, there's like a lot of reasons why it was like, okay, we're gonna have to just move this to another mission. Now, you then have the choice, well, don't show it at all, right? And that was certainly on on the conversations. And this is what I do. Like this is part of my job, is trying to figure out well how do you dramatize real events and how do you have to sometimes change them and move them. You know, I mean, for for example, you know, episode nine of Band of Brothers. I mean, this happens in in Band of Brothers all over the place. Just people don't quite get as upset about it. Um, but an example of it is in episode nine, um, uh, a, a lot of episode nine is, is kind of fictional because we don't know what those guys, a, a lot of what happened that in that two week period, but the, the scene when Winters goes into the house with the dog and the dog barks at him and Nixon goes out very, very embarrassed was a real aha moment for me when Dick Winters told me this story. It was a big moment of what the episode was about for me because the, the, this, this issue of Nixon walking in and, and feeling a conqueror and that he can just walk into somebody's house and take whatever he wants. And then the widow looks at him and Nixon realizes, no, no, that's a horrible way to behave that's not civilized mm. and then of course neither is killing jews in a concentration camp and we have that pay off at the end of the episode right none of that happened to nixon it happened to winters winters told me that story and i had already decided that uh, nixon would be the main character of that episode and when winters told me that story I said, do you mind if I transpose that story onto Nixon? Uh, because it really will help uh, the story and make Nixon. And he had no problem with it. You know, at, at, at th there, there is a moment where this is a TV show and, and we have to deliver an emotional truth to all of the people that aren't going to check when did Bubbles actually die. Yeah. You know, and I feel, trust me, that was not an easy decision with Bubbles. And it went back and forth and there are versions, but, but it never worked if it happened. I can't, again, I can't remember whether it happened off camera. It just never worked dramatically. And, and it has to work dramatically because again, the show was always designed around Crosby, not Bubbles. It was always about how does Bubbles affect Crosby? That that was Bubbles is in a, he he's not a device. He's a real man who was the real group navigator of the hundred, but he's a dramatic device for me 
for Crosby losing his best friend, which he did. That the feelings we show Crosby having in uh, you know uh, 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 October of forty three are the same feelings he had when Bubbles actually died six months later, right? right? So we're trying to show the audience that Crosby has lost his best friend, um, his navigating best friend. And I don't have time to do that in episode eight. So, and I need Crosby to be upset about something to send him to Oxford in episode six, because again, in reality, he didn't go to Oxford until think also in 44. Um, but we couldn't do it then because that wasn't the arc of the story, right? Mm. So we we pushed it forward so that we could counterpoint the the emotional narrative of both Crosby and Rosie having this downtime and making it coincide at the same time so that it's a non-mission episode and we're following our different four characters, well, not not Clevin, but but our on-camera characters. And they're 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 going through emotional shit. And if if I didn't have bubbles die at that point, rather than off camera in another mission where again, there's this other issue, which is the first we're trying to show how the first group is being replaced by the next group of of pilots as well. I don't know. Hopefully that that it, it, it was a thorough answer, and and if the fact it, you well, said, it's a, a thing that like like it's not done capriciously or or without deep thought, you know. Um, that one was was, and there were lots of arguments. Like I'm, he might be. I'm not sure we made the right decision, but that was the decision we made, and it works for me dramatically, you know. Well, thank you, and I think keeping it emotionally real is is perfect, and I'm thinking about as the book you must have on your shelf is the Roger Freeman Eighth oh, Air course. Force War Diary. Which but which Roger you, Freeman book do I have which, on my shelf? But the War Diary, it's emotionally, there's nothing emotional in it, is it? It's just it's just yeah, dates, it's dates, somewhere. dates, dates, and data. And it's 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 fantastically yeah. useful. Yeah. But it's the and but I wouldn't read that to try and understand what Cruz went through. That would be my was that exactly. March the 15th or March the 17th? Quick check. It's March the 17th. And there there is a thing, you know, listen, I do a lot of nonfiction adaptations. I, you know, obviously Band of Brothers. I've done another thing called A Mighty Heart, which is about Danny Pearl being killed, Wall Street Journal guy. I did a well, I sort of worked on a film called The Last Vermeer, which which was based on a true story. I, I, and scripts that haven't been made. So I do. A, I think about this stuff a lot of, of how you have to. Uh, drama is not reenactment. You know, yeah. this is not a reenactment. It is a drama. You know, Shakespeare. I, I wrote a movie about Shakespeare, and the Shakespeare histories are not history. You know, Henry V is a fabulous play, and it has some really interesting things about combat about leadership that are absolutely true. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. Mm -hmm. But if you think that's a history, you're wrong, that play, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, obviously the band of brothers, Pacific and Masters, ooh, tries to be as as true as possible. But But there is this other thing of, well, we want people who are not, counting every rivet to be intrigued as well. And that means they have to be emotionally intrigued with these characters mm. and their journeys. And it's my responsibility to get those people engaged with those people. And hey, I'm thrilled you even know who Bubbles is at this point, right? Mm. Like, you know, you didn't even know the guy existed four months ago. And now That's you know enough to tell point. me I'm wrong. And, and you know the World War II TV, and, and I say that respectfully. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, my job is done. You know, the the World War II TV audience is not the audience that is paying Apple back for its investment in this. It is it is the anoraks, and I'm and I'm including that term uh, affectionately, who are the ones who have have all the books and have an eight Air Force shelf, as most of the viewers watching right now have. But the majority of people watching that show have very little of a frame of reference about World War II and the combined bomber offensive, and you've got to grab them in with characters. But we'll do we'll do a few more questions before we bring things to an end. So uh, 
unfair question, he's, uh, Trevor is saying, but which episode is you are you most proud of? That is a really is indeed an unfair episode, especially um, as as we haven't gotten the finale. Um, I, I really do love episode nine. I, mm -hmm. I think it might be my favorite, but I, I love them all, and that's I think I think it's 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 not the fault of anything other than it is the emotional culmination of the previous eight episodes right. and you know this is this is again it's a different you know episode nine of or sorry episode 10 of of, of band is about a totally different thing <laughs> than this up you know like like this is like the last really good chapter of a book you know and everything comes together and the scale it's a movie it, it's it's its own movie in scale and i think emotionally it's it's you know really effective to hey let's talk about the baseball game in band of brothers mm. does anybody think that really happened well of course yeah <laughs> I mean, you know yeah. what i'm saying like like that's drama Right. And yeah. who's not crying when they watch that baseball yep. game? Yeah. Yeah. You know. And Malarkey um, wasn't there because Scott Grimes missed the missed the plane, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah I, exactly. Like or no, I think no, no. Malarkey had been shipped out earlier, I think. So, uh, there was there was I can't remember. Come, I can't I don't know. Who knows? We're, we're, who we're knows? digressing, but another great yeah, exactly. question from, from Scott Grimrod is will you be publishing the research yeah. you did for the show? It would have been interesting and useful. I wish I could, but it's it's not mine. It's Apple's, uh, you know. So it's really up to them. Okay. Um, and then from OTD military history, was more about Normandy left on the cutting room floor. And I have to say, as a guy living in Normandy, I could have gone out of my room for a cup of tea. I don't drink tea. Come back, and I kind of would have yeah. missed it because you told it from Crosby's point of view. Yeah, there was a version where we went up with Rosie and we see the Mickey's, and um, I had a great scene but it didn't it didn't make it to the final there's a whole storyline about radar and the advent of radar on the planes the mickeys mm -hmm. they called the mickeys yep, underneath yep. there would be so as the bombing strategy changed over the course of the war uh so did the technology uh they figure out to have a, a lead plane having this one device so that they could drop bombs they thought more accurately with this very, very crude Mickey machine. And there's a great, there's a great pilot from the hundredth who got cut out named Big Frank Valesh. And Big Frank Valesh was this guy, big guy. And he he had seven hang the expenses because he crashed six of them. And and finished his tour. He did his twenty five missions, but he crashed seven hang or six hang the expenses. But here's the kicker: they thought he was such a fuck up. They sent him out, and he's the guy because there was like this this unknown. Hey, we have an assignment. Send a pilot. I mean, nobody knew, and they just want let's get Frank the fuck out, right? Because he's always crashing planes. So they send Frank. Well, it turns out he's being trained to lead the entire group with this wow. new technology, the, the radar technology, and he's piloting over D-Day. And, and, and uh, actually, no, Rosie's piloting and, and Valesh is co-piloting. had a whole, but that whole storyline got cut. And what we found was best to cut a whole storyline than just have a little bit of it. Yeah. And okay. so, you know, you kill your babies, you know, yeah, I wish we had more of D-Day 2. On the other hand, you know, it's not the most exciting thing, um, what they did on D-Day, you know. Uh, Rosie did, I think, four or five sorties, um, not even in the early morning. Actually, we would have been cheating that. Um, he, didn't, he didn't fly, I think, until, you know, like noon on D-Day. Wow. Um, so... There you go. Well, a couple more things. So the one that was doing the rounds, particularly on the British pages, is is the series coming across as anti-British and our anti-RAF. So what what's the mm. John Orloff response to that? Well, the John Orloff response is both of those scenes are really accurate to the time. Um, you know, I, I don't think the show is intentionally anti-British. 
British in any sense. I know I am not. Um, and, you know, when, when the Americans arrived, I mean, if certainly the Crosby stuff, I know there was a lot of pushback with the Crosby stuff in episode six, that all comes from, from Crosby's book. So that's straight out of how, how he was treated in that right. Oxford thing. And then the one earlier on with the fight, you know, I, I don't know. It's not the, maybe the most um, uh, complex scene in the world, but uh, that was a, there was a, especially, I mean, again, this is really early days uh, of the Americans overseas. The relationship was not special. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite in those early days. Uh, and there was a lot of tension between the Brits and the Americans and the RAF and the American bomber boys. Uh, I mean, Don Miller goes into this a ton about the jealousy, about silly things like the uniforms. You know, the, the, the Brits' uniforms were horrible. The wool and they were heavy and all the Brits preferred the American uniforms. And then the Americans were getting paid 10 times more than the Brits. And so they were resentful about that. And, you know, so was there a different way to show it? Yeah, but, you know, again, those early episodes, and that's only episode two, we were really trying to show a more romanticized, stylized moment in the war. You know, these guys, these early guys from the American side, right? Not the Brits. Mm. From the American side, they had they they had just arrived in the war and they, they had been training for eight months, six months. But prior to that, they joined up because they were flyboys. They had yep. watched the version of Top Gun, right? They, they had literally watched the Top Gun of 1938, which is a film called Test Pilot, which yep. has two best friends, the two biggest movie stars of the time, Clark Gable, Spencer Tracy. They're in love with the same woman airplanes flying and that's why people join the air force right just like maverick and there was this sense of drama and romanticism and that was that's part of those early episodes is trying to capture that slightly larger than life aspect of these characters and and i think that fight sequence is a little larger than life thank you and then the last thing is and there's a representative question from David Levine in the aud audiences about the the narrative payoff of having the Tuskegees involved because that's the you know you you branch away from the eighth, include the fifteenth in. What's the whole rationale behind bringing them in and having the the, the prison camp scheme, scheme, uh, scenes? That is a much longer question, and I'd okay. rather not end on it just because okay. you know that that was again sort of like the bubbles thing you know, really intense, really long conversations about how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, why to do it. So let's end, I mean, we can go down that hole another time. Let's let's do know? that another I mean, time. I mean, but... it, it was, I will just say this, it was a decision from day one. Right. Once we knew that the Tuskegee Air, once I knew that the Tuskegee Airmen were uh, in camp, you know, were, were interned in Salag Luft III, um, in the actual camp that Buck and Bucky were in, we all thought we should include that right. and examine it. Now, how do you do that? There were lots of different things, but we're also up against the time issue, which is, you know, the Tuskegee guys don't, don't enter our theater really, you know, in, until 44. And, and we don't really enter 44 until episode seven. So, Anyway, so it was a very complicated process, and I'm happy to talk about the, the dramatic reasons we made, the choices we made on a more dramatic length we'll, conversation. We'll do that again. Um, Let's end great. on something else. Well, the one question that's been asked several times is, what's the rapier yeah. on the wall behind you? Oh, yeah. So, so uh, these guys are um, from the set, the planes. These, these are the... Uh, the, the planes they would use in the interrogation room or in the briefing room to yep, sort of yep. show the, hey, you're in this plane, you know, Egan's in this plane, Clevin's in that plane, they'd show each other. The sword, and then actually this is a early picture of an artist's rendition of, of what masters would look like. And then the sword, the rapier, is uh, a prop 
from a movie I wrote and, and produced called Anonymous, which is about William Shakespeare and, and a 16th century Elizabethan sort of whodunit. Oh, yeah, I remember um, that one. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's that's the uh, the prop of my main character. Well, let's end on a, an interesting one. And, and you're not allowed to say a fake one, but and Bruce sure. Bay is asking, have you ever been in a B-17? I assume he means flying. I have been in a B-17, thanks to the very, very nice people at uh, Duxford. The, the one that's in the museum, not moving, not flying. Um, I have to say, I have no desire to fly in a B-17. I've had many offers in the last 10 years. Uh, but I just sort of feel like, you know what? Those are really old planes. I think they're museum pieces. I am a-okay just hanging out on the ground. Well, that's a really great, great way to bring it to an end because if there's one thing this series has done, it's given the entire world an understanding of what it was like to be in a B-17 without actually having to endanger ourselves by exactly. going to real and flying into occupied France and Germany and, and Denmark and all the other places. They go, well, John... We extended by about 15 minutes beyond what, what yes. Apple asked us to do, but what the hell? We've had a great time. I'd love yeah. to bring you back in the future and go into some, some more deeper dive than this. I, it would be my pleasure. See episode nine tomorrow and bring it, see yeah. all there, and, then, and then go back and watch. We'll, the talk in, we'll talk in a couple of months after everybody's digested it and, and maybe rewatched it like in a more you know, one or two sittings, which is but when I the shoes are it... slightly more comfortable to go back to my analogy, when we've broken in those shoes. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I think the show works really, really well in one or two sittings, you know, right. when you look at it as one story um, rather than an episode of television, you know, we, 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 I know that Tom, Stephen, Gary, and I always talked about this as a long one single movie. You know, think of Lord of the Rings. Think of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. You know, that's one story, those those nine movies, you know, um, or no, six movies, but however many, three movies. You cut them in so that. many different ways. However many, <laughs> it's nine well, hours. That much I know. Like if you watch the director's cut, it's nine hours of Lord of the Rings and it's one story and you cut away to a couple of other characters and then you come back to the main story. And that's kind of what Masters of the Air is. So. Enjoy. Well, we'll leave it there. On that note, John, it's been absolutely a fantastic pleasure talking to you. We've got well, Hattie I knew Hearn. this would be fun, Paul, so thank you. Thank you. We've got Hattie Hearn on with us tomorrow talking about her point of view from the American Air Museum up at Duxford and some history of the 100th Bomb Group. Then we've got Stephen on on Friday talking about the special effects. So lots more Masters of Make the sure Air Make sure you, you know, I, I just want your audience to know, I think of, of Chris Seegers and Stephen Rosenbaum and a couple of other people, uh, Colleen Atwood, but Stephen is Stephen Rosenbaum in particular is like a co-author to me on this show. He, well, he, you cannot underestimate people. his importance to the final show and his dedication to getting as much right as he could. Brilliant. Well, that'll be Friday. So, folks, thank you very much for your questions and insight. I will see you all in, in tomorrow again tomorrow. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Curry. Curry. Curry.